right, go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to Village Church. If you don't know me, which I assume all of you do, my name's Steve. I'm one of the pastors here at Village Church, and I am grateful that you've come out this morning. The snow came in a little earlier than we expected it to, but it is such a privilege to be able to share God's Word, and I, that's never lost on me. So I certainly do thank you for making the journey out this morning in the snow to hear God's voice for our lives. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open it to the book of Luke, chapter 1. We're going to be starting in verse 46 this morning and going through what's often called Mary's Magnificat. Uh, But we are in the thick of the Christmas season. And if you kind of caught on last week, what the basis of this series is, is really a series about joy. And so every single week, we're going to go through a different uh, kind of vantage point or a different perspective as to why and how we should have joy in this season. So often, our joy is lost because of really subjective reasons in our lives. Often, our joy is as temperamental as our mood is. Our joy is often set by whatever is in my life at this point point, and our joy kind of flows with however uh, the circumstances of our lives really are. And I don't know what you're going through in this season. I don't know if you've experienced the best year of your life. I don't know if you've had the worst year of your life. I don't know if you look at it and you say, well, all in all, it was kind of just moot. Nothing really of note happened this season. I'm kind of in the same mood I was last year. But so many things happened in our lives to kind of bring us back and forth. And one of the most interesting things that I talk about is the issue of joy, because I kind of received the most feedback, kind of positive and negative, about joy, because some of us receive this, and we are naturally or chemically uh, joyful people. And, and the, the key is, is that, that we love hearing about joy, and for some of you, you like hearing about joy because you don't consider yourself a joyful person and you love having the reminders. But there are always a, a group that isn't joyful, nor do you want me to tell you to be joyful, because you have so many reasons that you think legitimize your lack of joy. And what I want to kind of explain to you in that is, I understand, but what you don't understand is, is that you are not the only person for reasons to not be joyful. There are so many reasons that each and every one of us, and I always say suffering is subjective. Uh, Everybody goes through hard times. It's just a different degree of difficult times. And I am not completely divorced away from reasons to lose joy as every one of us endure those seasons. But my purpose for you is for you specifically to understand that your lack of joy is connected to your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you do not have joy, you are struggling in your faith. I don't need you to admit that to me for it to be a reality. But not only does it say that there is a struggle with your faith in Jesus Christ, not only does it diagnose an issue with your faith in Jesus Christ, but if we choose to be hard-hearted and believe that we are either unchangeable or not in need of change, that can serve as a slope towards denial of faith in Jesus Christ. And that is the specific thing that I want to warn you against. Is that no matter what you endure in this life, whether it is what you would consider a small suffering or whether you would consider it large-scale pain and suffering, whether you believe that you've endured a little bit of criticism or whether you believe all you endure is criticism, I know how that feels, or whether you are just a little bit discouraged or whether you are a lot of bit discouraged, what I want you to understand is that as long as you root your life in those earthly things, you will never have the joy that you could if you would root it down in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Christmas gives us this amazing opportunity to reflect on the fact that God became man. And as Philippians chapter 2 calls it, he humiliated himself to come into this world in order that he might offer to us redemption 
at great detriment to himself. And whatever you're going through, it isn't that God doesn't love you because he, he lowered himself into the deepest depths of suffering for you. We do not have a God who is far off from our problems, but instead we have a God who is tempted in every way that we've ever been tempted and who has experienced the greatest depths of spiritual, physical, and emotional suffering that any of us could ever endure. And he did it because of the joy that was set before him, Hebrews tells us. And so because of that, everything that you endure in your life, whether it be suffering that is just an internal suffering that you really can't explain, or whether it is because of exterior attack that you feel like you are enduring over and over and over again, when you look to the gospel, you look to a God that has not only endured such hardship, but you look to a God who endured that at great cost to himself, who died because of your sin and for your sin and because of every sin that has ever been done to you, against you. But he also is victorious over every single one of them in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so when you look to the manger, when you look to the life and birth of Jesus Christ, we understand that this is a Savior who has experienced nothing but joy and chose to sacrifice that joy for you to endure a life of humiliation and suffering so that you could share in His joy for eternity. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is why... We must fight for joy in this life. And that is why when you don't fight for joy, you are missing out on the beauty of the gospel as a whole. Because God would have us be joyful in every single circumstance that we've ever endured. And what's interesting about the gospel narrative to me, and we have in the countdown had it's the most wonderful time of the year. Can, can I just tell you that as a somebody that preaches most Sundays, when they're forecasting for snow, I know I'm going to have a miserable Saturday night. I mean, it's just the worst. I didn't enjoy anything about my evening last evening because I'm sitting there thinking, this church is canceled, that church is canceled, this church is canceled, that church is canceled. And from my perspective, it hasn't even snowed yet. Why would I cancel? Which is an advent of uh, social media. Only social media has invented that kind of hysteria. Uh, we used to get along just fine. But when I'm having to do that, it's like this, this, this suffering that would not cease the entire evening. And you might say, but Steve, that's not real suffering. Right, but you don't understand that moment's not suffering. It is the criticism that is set before me that is the suffering. It's like, oh my goodness, if I cancel, it's because I'm a coward. If I don't, it's because I want people to die. There is no win in this situation. And so we go through these small things, and then you preach it's the most wonderful time of the year, and I would say this is not the most wonderful morning of the year. But it is. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. And we, we think that is so cliche. We look at that and we say, oh, sure, that's an easy thing for you to say. But it is the truth. It is what we believe as Christians. And there's no one that has endured quite an uncomfortable situation quite a situation that brings us into more criticism, into more doubt, into more, really, accusation than the endurance of the mother of Jesus in this specific time of the year. When I look at Mary, I don't see perfect righteousness. The Catholic Church has that completely wrong. She's not the fourth member of the Trinity. She's a human being. She's imperfect. She has known sin. But when I look at Mary and I look at what she was not just called by God to endure, because the amazing thing about the way we treat the calling of God in our life is that we have a choice, which we shouldn't, and which Mary didn't. 
God didn't come to Mary and say, would you like this? God went to Mary and said, this is. God went to Mary, who was betrothed to Joseph, which is a legal type of engagement. But the thing about being <clears throat> betrothed in first century uh, Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, Nazareth, is that it was a legally binding period of time to ensure the purity of both parties. And she's a young girl, saved herself for marriage, in love with Joseph, headed towards the end of this engagement period where she would experience great marriage, a great family to come, great reputation because they did things God's way. And God intervenes into her life and He gives her a gift that we look at as a gift. But in her situation, it's a gift that's going to ruin her reputation. It's going to cost her her engagement. It's going to cost her her entire family. It's going to force her to be put away to save her reputation from the public and is going to take away everything that she's ever hoped for in her life. And that was Mary's experience of the most wonderful time of the year. But we often treat her as though, oh my goodness, this divine reality, an angel comes to her and says, Mary, you're, you're pregnant. And of course, Mary's response is, how can this be? <laughs> I've never known a man. And we look at it and we say, oh, she must have been so happy. And I'll be frank with you, the Bible's completely silent on this, but I don't know that I could have been. I don't know that you could have been. For you parents, I don't know if you would look at your daughter and say, what a wonderful gift. Now you'd probably say, oh my gosh, my daughter's a liar. And Mary's response to this gift that's going to really bring into danger the loss of every dream that she's ever had for her life is what we have in Luke 1, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in the God of my Savior. For He has looked on the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For He who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is His name. And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones, exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich He has sent away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy as He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Number one this morning, Christmas is a season of God's glory. Christmas is a season of God's glory. What's interesting about the perspective that Mary has is that it is an uncommon faith that will give you a perspective that will elevate the glory of God at the detriment of your life. And what Mary does in this very first stanza of what is a praise song that she wrote about what she was enduring at this point in her life is she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. At the drop of a moment of discomfort, does your soul magnify the Lord? The term for magnify is an interesting term because it is the exact same term that the New Testament also uses for glory. And so what Mary is saying here is, I want my life, the core of who I am, the essence of what makes me, me. That's what she means when she says, my soul. She says, I want my life to be defined by the glory of God in every instance. And this is a song of praise that she gives in response to what many people are going to use to say that she is an impure young woman. Her own fiancé, his response immediately to this is to put her away quietly 
so that she won't endure too much ridicule. And see, when we read all of the narratives of the Christmas story, it all adds up to this great moment where we get to see people who are not that mature in life. They're very young. Respond in faith in ways that must challenge the way that we respond to the coffee getting too cold too quickly. Or the creamer not tasting the way that I like it to taste. Or I got a blister on my foot. Have you ever questioned the love of God for you over a stubbed toe? And you say, oh, heavens no. Yes, you have, you liar. You ever proclaim something to be the worst day of your life over a meal? Or a conversation? Or an upset stomach? Or a meeting that didn't go the way that you wanted it to go? Or a response that you received from someone that you took as a 100-pound response, but they only meant it as a 10-pound critique? Our lives are so fragile that they fall apart at the drop of a pin so often. But we treat our lives as though every second and every situation and every conversation and every reaction and every choice will define the next century of my being. And Mary has literally received news that she's going to have the entire direction of her life altered. And she's been told by God, you will endure pain because of what God is doing in your life. And Mary's response is, God, just use me for your glory in any and every situation. How do you respond to the slightest of discomfort, to the greatest of suffering. Mary did not look at her life or her future or her worldly existence as something to be protected at the cost of God. Instead, Mary looked at her life as an offering to be given at whatever God would call her to. Mary was not protecting her life from risk. Mary was perfectly willing to risk it all for the glory of God. And it's not that Mary had a knowledge that would tell her exactly how it was going to spell out. You know, when I only have to preach once, it's dangerous. But sometimes I get so irritated when people criticize the song, Mary, Did You Know? And it's not just because I like the song. You know, and, and some of you are like, oh, I just love that song. Why are you telling me this? Um, well, because I like to, to ruin lives. But some people look at that song and they say, of course she knew. Did she is always my response. Yeah, she knew what God had told her but she didn't know so much. And it was this revelation from God that she couldn't have known how her parents were going to respond. She couldn't have known how Joseph was going to respond. She couldn't have known how her neighbors, how society, she couldn't know what it would be like to have the knowledge that when she looks at a baby that she brought into this world, that it is literally the Son of God. Could you imagine the pressure of having to raise the eternal creator? Could you imagine that first moment that she had to appease his crying? You want to talk about a bad Christmas song? Away in a manger. Jesus cried. Okay, he had dirty diapers. But could you imagine being Mary at this child who's in your arms crying for a reason that you can't figure out, and you look and you say, I'm failing the Son of God. See, as a parent, I know the feeling 
of making mistakes and thinking I might be failing this great responsibility that God has given me. But could you imagine what it would be like to put that on a scale of knowing that this baby is actually God the Son incarnate? That's what Mary is walking into. And I can only imagine the terror of that moment. I can only imagine the terror of that realization. Because in Luke 1.34, Mary doesn't respond to the angel by saying, of course, this will be wonderful. No, Mary's response is, how can this be? That's a human response. How can this be? And for the rest of her life, she would be walking into unexpected situation after unexpected situation because she had the concrete foundational knowledge of the what and the who, but she did not have the concrete knowledge of the how and the when. To the extent, well, could you imagine as a mother knowing he's the son of God, but he's on the cross, he is suffering, he is dying. Everyone is defaming his reputation. Everyone is calling him a blasphemer. Everyone is calling him an insurrectionist. And all that you can say is, that is my son. But I know he's God the son. I don't know how to endure this though. But Mary looks at it and she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My desire is the glory of God above absolutely everything else. And I look at that and I say, I need that faith. I need to trust God like that with every situation of my life. I need to trust God like that with my family. I need to trust God like that with my church. I need to trust God like that with my own life. And I have to ask myself, do I? Do I? She says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. When I was growing up, I cannot for the life of me remember who said this, but he said, attitude is everything. And when I was growing up in the late 80s and early 90s, I remember that was just a mantra that so many people spoke, is that attitude is everything. And I think to the detriment of our society, especially to the detriment of our souls, we don't really care about attitude. We care about results. But what Mary shows when she says, my spirit, she's saying who I am rejoices because God is bringing salvation into my life. He is my savior. Could you imagine in the moment of ruin to look to God and say, what everyone will call ruin, I will call salvation. That is an irregular Attitude. She trusted God when her situation should have overwhelmed her to despair. The term glory in this instance in the original language literally means to cause something to be held in higher esteem by oneself and others. She's saying, God, I want to care more about your glory than I currently care. I want to care more about your worship than I currently care. And I think I can't imagine caring more than she cares right here. But she says, the trajectory of my life is more of God's glory, never less. More of God, my Savior, never less. God can and will use every circumstance to his glory. And that's the faith that Mary had. In Habakkuk chapter 3, the prophet with the oddest name, he is in a terrible time in Israel. God has brought him the opposite of good news. God has brought him bad news. And God takes him through this journey of correcting his attitude about God's plan for God's glory. And God tells him, my glory is going to overwhelm the entire world. But then at the very end, at the conclusion of Habakkuk, Habakkuk responds to the totality of the revelation he says, though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. In Psalm 34, 2 through 3, David writes this way. He says, my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Do not lose the importance of your attitude towards God in your life. 
Do not lose the importance of your attitude, quite frankly, above everything else. Because it is your attitude towards where God has you, what God has you enduring, and how God postures you through those moments that tell you the greatest story of your faith. God is going to use every situation in your life, both what you enjoy and what you don't, to humble you. Or you will use it to build your ego. Mary is humble. Number two, Christmas is a season of God's mercy. Christmas is a season of God's mercy. I mean, can you imagine God derails your entire life and you say, what a great testament to the mercy of God. I, I struggle with that attitude when my eggs aren't cooked right. In verse 48, Mary says, For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. She postures herself in comparison to who God is. And she says, I am a humble servant. He is the God of glory. He will do great things even through the hardest of circumstances of my life. Because He is mighty. I think so often we get this perspective that God is looking all over the earth for mighty people. That God is looking throughout the earth for those who measure up. That God is looking for the people of the greatest ability. That God is looking for the people who can do the best. But that is never the testament that we get from Scripture. And that's why so often so many people love reading about Scripture but struggle to read Scripture, which is always better. Because the Scripture does not present to us the same picture the books about Scripture point to us because books about Scripture have a way of building us up where Scripture would humiliate us. And Mary looks and she postures herself not as someone who deserves the Son of God being in her bloodline, but instead she says, God has seen me in my humiliation. He who is mighty will make me blessed. Nothing Mary says is ever about her ability. Nothing Mary ever says is about what she deserves. But instead, she postures herself about the mighty hand of God and her necessity of having it move in her life or anything good to come of it. So often, we miss out on the greatest moves of God in our life because our mentality is about what about me? What do I deserve? What should I receive because of what I have done, because of what I have invested? And none of us are left out of that sin. Not a one. And Mary, though, has this perspective where she says, it is the mighty hand of God that I am in need of moving. She never says, God, I deserve to be called blessed. What about my blessing? What about the elevation that I deserve? What about the position that I should be given in this life? You are making me sacrifice so much. What about me? If you have that mentality, your faith is in danger. Mary's mentality is, God has looked upon my humble estate. And what she means by that is, God has looked at someone who is undeserving of blessing and is rather deserving of wrath. Because she does not believe she deserves the blessing of God. She deserves the opposite. See, that's why... Faith is counted as righteousness because faith requires you to measure who you are in view of who God is. And if you are not humbled to a position of, I don't deserve good from him, I deserve bad from him, then you cannot have faith in Jesus Christ. Because faith in Jesus Christ requires you to have a perspective of yourself that you are a needy beggar. It does not bring you into a position of, look at how good I am. 
And Mary looks and she rejoices in her position and posture of humility and the great stature and might of the Lord. So often when we think about, you know, I mean, if you look through the most wonderful time of the year, the song, I love it because it's all about, you know, eating food, which is one of, it's my favorite hobby. When people ask me, Steve, what do you like to do for fun? I'm, ne- I'm never honest because if I were to tell you, it will be eat quarter pounders. That's a good night. And is there a large fry that's coming with it? Even better night. And then if we can hit fourth meal at Taco Bell, oh man, that's Shekinah glory right there, folks. You don't even know the favor of God to live in that society. But when we talk about, you know, just the mistletoe is hung, the stockings are there, my friends and family are surrounding me. We're looking back on the last year and the grace that it is to be together with you and to experience good things. And I think some of us look at that and we're just like, bah humbug, it hasn't been a great year. Do you ever really look at the fact that every moment of happiness in our lives, everything that we enjoy, every little instance of just laughter is a grace that we don't deserve. It's a gift that God doesn't have to give us. You see, Mary understands that she deserves wrath because of the might of God, yet he is allowing her to enjoy this moment. See, it is only repentant faith that can allow you to enjoy the moments where God's grace is more in view than in other moments. I do not believe there is a single person here that does not know what happiness is in a moment. I don't believe there is a single person here that has not known happiness in the recent past. But what I want you to understand is is that even if you're not enduring happiness right now and you have to look back nostalgic, you did not deserve that happiness. You didn't deserve it. There is so much over the next few weeks that I'm going to be able to endure with happiness. I'm going to have movie nights with my children where we watch Christmas movies that I love and I pretend that it's for them. So I wouldn't watch this if you weren't here, but since you are. Every moment of that is grace that I don't deserve. Do not miss those moments because you are missing a mighty God allowing you a common grace that you don't deserve to experience. But because of his great hand, he allows us to. It's a season of God's mercy. It's an inconvenient gift that God gives Mary, yet she looks and she says, your might will have me blessed. In Psalm 138, 6, it echoes this reality. It says, For though the Lord is high, He regards the lowly, but the haughty He knows from afar. You see, it is a frame of mind that God is after in your life. He regards the lowly. And I think we misunderstand what He's saying there. I think some of us would take that and we would turn that into a stoic reality where we never experience anything in this world of any pleasure and would say that's what it means to be lowly. No, what he's talking about here is an attitude of faith that postures you to know who you are in light of who God is. And the reason I know that is because of the term haughty that he uses. This is a term that would have you as being so proud that you would scoff at humility that you would scoff at needing to serve God. And he says he's there with those who know who he is in light of who they are, who know what they deserve, but the grace that God has given. He's close to them. But the person that would scoff at need, the person that would elevate their ability, the person that would fake it till they make it, God says, I'm nowhere near you. Attitude is everything. We are in so much need of God's mercy. Have you postured your life in that way? 
Because the great testimony that Mary gives is that he gives that mercy. He allows such wonderful blessing, such wonderful experiences in our lives. But more than that, he says, I will not just give you the trinket because you would make an idol out of that. He says, I will give you the maker of trinkets. He gives himself. But it's only with the right attitude that you can be thankful for that. Number three, Christmas is a season of God's faithfulness. You know, God keeps his word every time. Every time. There has never been a moment where God has not kept a promise. You know why I hate not keeping promises? It's because I know I have the ability to not keep a promise. God doesn't know what that's like. God has never made a commitment that He has not lived up to. God has never made a promise that He has not kept. And in verses 52 through 55, it is almost, and I love the way she transitions, it is almost as if Mary purposefully transitions to prove a case that she has been building. It's almost that in verse 46 to verse 51, Mary presents a case about her life. She says, this is the direction of my life. This is the trajectory of where I'm headed. It's wonderful. It's not to be disregarded. It's not going to be a life of disgrace. God is at work. I'm going to be blessed through it. And then in verse 52, she recounts God's work for Israel. This is such a great moment where we need to understand why we need to know about God's move of history, um, God's moves through history in the past. See, I think some of we're acquainted with God's faithfulness. In other words, we can say the terms, we can say the places, we can say the people, we can say even like the terms of the events. But do we know how God has worked on a personal level? Do we look to the Psalms where they recount God's steadfast love for his people, that he called them from one land to another, that he took them out of slavery through the Red Sea, into the wilderness, giving them water and food, into the promised land where he gave them great victory, into exile that he promised to endure them through, and then on to this moment for Mary. Because what Mary is saying in verses 52 through 55 is that, in starting in verse 52, he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Mary knows that she's a nobody. Do you see that? Mary knows that she is not Caesar Augustus. She says, I am a nobody. And because I'm a nobody, I can trust God. Because this is a God that has brought down kings. And he exalts the humble. And that's me. See, Mary goes on and she says, he's filled the hungry with good things. Those who don't need him, he sends away empty. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. He worked through Abraham and his offspring forever. See, Mary is keen to what God is doing because Mary knows what God has promised. She said, God promised to bless the nations through Abraham. But I would have never imagined I would be used to the fulfillment of that promise. That's what Mary's saying. Saying, I can trust this God because he is keeping his promise even in this moment. You see, friend, in every moment of your life, you must seek to remember God's faithfulness to his promises. Because when you can remember that, when your future is foggy, which, friends, let me tell you something. You will, I guarantee it, experience so many moments where your future is foggy. You will not only experience a few, you will experience many. 
where it seems like you're going to be enveloped by the fog completely. And in those moments, you do not need a prophecy that promises you leisure tomorrow. You need a remembrance and a reminder of the faithfulness of God yesterday. Because that's how you can trust to keep walking forward. Because he endured his people from sin in the garden to marry in a, ma in, in a cave, in a stable, to a church, to an eternity. And when you lose that, what happens is that's the moment where you become an individual on a personal quest. The most dangerous people I've ever met were individuals on personal quests because they did not need a reminder of God's faithfulness to his people. They were overwhelmed by a personal vision that God could only do through them. That is haughtiness. That is pride. In every moment of your life, you will be reminded of God's mercy on your behalf when you understand that you are a part of a great history of the move of God. You see, God is faithful to bless those who trust him. Abraham trusted God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In the Old Testament, there's a prophet, it's a lesser known prophet, his name is Micah. And during a hard time in Israel, his book signifies the journey of the nation of Israel. Micah 7, 7 through 8 states that the current circumstances does not make the entire statement of God's faithfulness. Note what he says. He says, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not over me, O my enemy, when I fall. I shall rise when I sit in the darkness. The Lord will be a light to me. You see, What's interesting is, is that Mary does not say, Lord, you've given me this, therefore no one will question my purity. Lord, you have given me this, therefore my parents will believe me. Lord, you've brought this into my life, therefore it will be easy. No, she says, Lord, you have brought this into my life and you've been faithful. Therefore, I will just trust you. The beautiful thing about what Micah says is he says, my enemy might prevail. My enemy might overwhelm me. My enemy may defeat me. I may be left with nothing but darkness all around, but my enemy will not defeat me ultimately. My enemy will not defeat me eternally. I might be in the darkness, but God will always be my light. Friend, God is faithful. God was faithful to Mary. God was merciful to Mary. God was glorified through Mary. Every moment of your life is an opportunity for you to learn about yourself and your God when you have the right perspective of a faith that breeds humility, that understands who God is in reality to who you are, but trusts that He will have glory, he will give mercy, and he will be faithful. That is what Mary had. And it's something that each and every one of us can have. And we can have it through faith in Jesus Christ. Every single one of us is given an opportunity in our lives to put our faith in Jesus Christ. But then after that, opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to exercise that faith. To not realize how great I am becoming, but to realize how great God always is. And in that, I will become humble. 
and he will become elevated, and I will trust him more if I always turn to him above absolutely everything else. Every Sunday, we reflect on communion. We look to the bread, we look to the cup, which represents the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I tell you that that is why this is the most wonderful time of the year. Because while kids love it more than adults, the reason that they love it more than adults is because they have not bought into the lie that your circumstances determine your joy. Faith humbles you. Because God is working to make you more dependent on Him. And that, to me, is the joy of this season. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then come eat and drink, and then go enjoy the life that God has designed for you. When you're ready, come.